Erev Tov, everybody. Welcome to another edition of our Monday night class. We are studying Pirke Avot. We are in the weeks between Pesach and Shavuot. Tonight we are studying Chapter 4, Mishnah and Perek Dalet. Tonight's class is sponsored by Mr. and Mrs. Ali Revivo in memory of his brother, Mr. Moshe Revivo Zichonoli Racha. May the words of Torah that we say tonight be Lulu Nishmato, Tihin Bitzor HaChaim, I'd like to welcome you all here that are joining live and those listening on the recording on our podcast, findingholiness.buzzsprout.com, where you can, Baruch Hashem, grab and catch, listen to, be inspired by all the shiurim um, that are given throughout the week. Lots to choose on the parasha, on musar, on ethics, on random ideas. It's yours for the taking. By all means, have a look, findingholiness.buzzsprout.com. And the final reminder to the members of the uh, of my respective synagogue, that this coming week we have our yearly fundraiser, the Hilulav Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, which will take place on Thursday night slash Friday. It is our uh, wonderful fundraiser. Well, of course, we will be doing it virtually. Uh, we encourage you all, we urge you all to go and um, give from your heart to help uh, maintain our lovely, beautiful building and all the wonderful things that we offer, even though during these difficult times, you can check out um, some items we have for auction, some buy now at the website kehilastore.com, K-E-H-I-L-A store.com. And of course, all proceeds will get tax receipts, all the, we'll give you a tax receipt, and of course, go to support the wonderful initiatives we have at our Kehila Center. One of the most amazing things about Perke Avot is how some of the Mishnayot um, are, can be so heavy, can be so philosophical. And then just moving on to the next Mishnah, you get to extremely simple and practical. Um, Perik Dalid has no share, uh, is, no, is no different in, in respect that it contains Mishnayot that are very heavy and require a lot of thinking and analysis. And then you have very simple ones. Um, just before the one we're going to talk about today is the uh, Mishnah of Rabbi Yanai, who talks about that it's not in our power to explain the tranquility of the wicked people and the suffering of the righteous. That's the million dollar question in this world, how we to understand how God uh, repays the righteous sometimes to suffering and brings a lot of what seems to be blessing to those who are wicked, that's not what we're going to focus on tonight, but we're actually going to focus on the next Mishnah, one that um, at, at just face value seems to be quite simple. Tonight we are studying para, uh, Mishnah Kaf, which is the 20th Mishnah in the 4th Perik, that is authored by Rabbi Matia ben Harash. So you can follow it inside if you have a Mishnah Perik in front of you, or you can just listen. Rabbi Matia ben Harash Omer, Rabbi Matia, the son of Harash, says, Heve makdim bishlom kol adam. Initiate a greeting to every person. Veheve zanab la'arayot. Be a tail to lions. Ve'al tehi rosh leshu'alim. Rather than a head to foxes. So again, Initiate a greeting to every person, be a tail to lions rather than a head to foxes. So maybe what the Chachamim is te- are telling us here that we can't really delve too much into the unanswerable inquiries or quandaries of life. We can analyze, we try to understand, but in the end of the day, you got to remember what's simple. You have to remember not to forget to say hello to your neighbor. Judaism is a very practical religion. It, in fact, almost always teaches us to be decent, to be reasonable um, in our behavior towards Hashem, our behavior towards our fellow man, and our environment. These are our principles of faith, philosophy, that we have to adhere to constantly. We have to internalize. But they only become reality through simple acts of goodness. Saying hello is probably the easiest or greatest way to start this process. As we all know, we know the effect of how much a cheerful greeting can accomplish through 
very little investment of time and effort. The Gemara tells us about Rabbi Yohanan ben Zakkai, who was the leader of religious Jewry in the generation immediately following the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash. He was always the first to greet whoever, whoever he came across, whether it was a Jew or a non-Jew on the street. And the Gemara tells us because of that, he was zochet to live a very long life. He asked him, why do you live a long life? Well, this is why, because I initiate greeting. We can easily imagine that a world leader would have far too much on his mind, be busy with too many things in life to pay much attention to the little man or the, the guy on the street who no one pays attention to. But from the Jewish perspective, a person only becomes a leader by recognizing that the world, yes, consists of these little men, of individuals who may not have the stature, every one of which who deserves respect and attention. In a practical sense, there are a lot of benefits to greeting another person. Number one, it warms the recipient. This person has now been deemed worthy by another person's regard. Second, it reminds the giver that other people are worthy of such regard. It shakes out our own self-absorption, reminds us to be concerned about the well-being of others. And third, if the greeter is visibly Jewish, then it reflects positively on our religion. It becomes a Kiddush Hashem sanctifying God's name. Judaism is a religion that cares about everyone, no matter where you stand from. We may differ in our outlook, we may differ in our dress, in our substance, in the performance of our commandments that many other religions don't have, but in no way does it interfere with the common courtesy to which all human beings are, are entitled to. And Rabbi Matya ben Harash is advising us to be unconditional to, in, our, in our greetings. Uh, saying hello to others should not be something that is robotic. It should be something that is reflexive. It, it doesn't, your person shouldn't have to stop to think whether or not this person deserves a hello or a goodbye from me. A greeting is free. It doesn't cost money. It's invaluable. Never ask ourselves first whether this person deserves our greeting. It should be done naturally. We greet everyone, both Jew and non-Jew, because they are human beings. Human beings are created in the image of God. No more justification is necessary. No sure to be th sought after to greet our, uh, our fellow man. Such simple advice. You would think, why would Rabbi Matyab ben Harash have to say this? Let me tell you a little bit something about Rabbi Matyab ben Harash, who he was. They say, brought down in the Midrash, Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Matyab ben Harash was sitting in the Bet Midrash and his face was glimmering like the sun. It was, people were afraid to approach him. That's how holy he was. The Satan, the Midrash writes, the Satan went up to God and said, goes, who's this guy? What's this guy doing? He's, st he's standing out. He's, he's lighting up the room with his uh, brightness. He's, is he that holy? God told the Satan, listen, don't even bother. You don't stand a chance with this, with this uh, Tzaddik. He said, Tzaddik Gamur, because he is so focused on his study, he doesn't even look around him. He hasn't looked at any woman other than his wife. This is how holy he is. The Satan says, are you going to test me, God? I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. So the Satan, Midrash writes, disguised itself to uh, dress up as the most beautiful woman ever seen. Not since the time of Adam HaRishon. Which we say was one of the most beautiful women to ever live. God dressed up as this woman and approached Rabbi Matya ben Harash to see if he can entice him to peek or to look at or to maybe sin. So he came on the left side and the Rabbi Matya ben Harash turned his face like this to the right. He went on the right side, he turned his face, he wouldn't, wouldn't do anything. Finally, the Satan wasn't giving up until Rabbi Matya ben Harash couldn't take it anymore. And he called up his servant, he says, I want you to bring me a, a masmir, I want you to bring me a nail and a fire. And he takes a nail and an ish. And he burns, burns the, 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 the nail with, uh, heats it up with fire, takes the nail and pierces both of his eyes so that he doesn't see the Satan disguised as, as, this, as this beautiful woman. The Satan sees what happens and Satan falls back down. Can't believe it. He's, he's done. He finished. He lost. 
HaKadosh Baruch Hu sends Malach Rafael to go down and heal Rabbi Matya ben Harash. Go down and heal Rabbi Matya ben Harash. And uh, the Malach comes down, says, uh, we can't even see. He goes, hi, I'm here to, he I'm here to heal you. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that I'm here to heal you because of what you did. You have nothing to worry about. Rabbi Matya ben Harash says, I'm not interested. Don't heal me. Because I don't want the I don't want a chance that maybe the Satan will come back and I'm gonna have to see, and I, he's gonna put me in another predicament. I'm not interested. Keep me blind. Masha yeah, yeah. Done. It's over. It's finished. So so Malach Rafael didn't know what to do. He went back to God. He says, God, this is what he wants uh, wants me to do. He doesn't want me to heal him. God said to the Malach, Go tell to be Matya ben Harash, I promise him that he will never encounter the Yetzirah Satan again, the Yetzirah again. He went back, he told Rabbi Matya ben Harash, and he accepted. And the Malach Rafael came and healed Rabbi Matya ben Harash and gave him his vision back. This is who we're dealing with. So if we're dealing with such a tzaddik, an angel in his own right, a man whose face shone like the sun, you would think he was going to provide you with the greatest piece of Torah information never known to man. What does he come and tell us? Be the first to say hello to your friend. This is the piece of information that he wants us to live by. Something to, so simple. Because it doesn't necessarily mean that to be the greatest Jew, you have to understand the deepest Kabbalistic concepts. To be a great Jew, says Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, in the beginning of his, of his great Sefer, Mesilat Yesharim, I'm going to teach you something that you already know. I'm going to teach you how to be a decent human being. His book is not filled with insights and novelties, even though it probably is. This is common knowledge that we know we have to do. But somehow, something that is so simple, something that is so obvious to us, maybe because it's so obvious, it's typically neglected by laymen and neglected by scholars. It's something that with no question we have to work on every single person. I find that unfortunately those of us that live here in, the, in, in colder climates such as Canada and we don't get out often, we have this reputation of being colder people. That uh, maybe it is because of the weather. We are indoors more. We, we associate ourselves only with our tight-knit family. And we're not really quick to you know, extend greetings to our friends when we see them. We mind our own business. We stay quiet. I experience this myself every time I travel to, to Florida or Miami. And I'm walking on the street and I have my head down. I, I remember this vividly. And people are so quick to say, hey, good morning. And I'm like, I'm caught off guard. This never happens where I'm from. You know, good, mo like, good morning. And one after the other. I thought it was coincidence. But no, one after the other, everyone is saying good morning to me. Again, it could be the warmer climate. It could be the fact that they're constantly outside down in, uh, in the southern United States. Maybe true. Maybe true. But that doesn't exempt us from being the first to initiate a greeting. Common courtesy. It's not Kabbalistic concepts. Says Abi Matya ben Harash. This is something that is so important. Maybe this is what made him so great. Definitely Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai lived such a long life for doing so. All the more so when we live today in, this, in, in the world that we live today. Abutai cannot stress how many people are suffering out there right now. People that are suffering mentally. People that are suffering with extreme anxiety. Not knowing what's going to be tomorrow. Not knowing what's going to be in the next hour. There are so many different parts of life that are messed up. That it's, it's, it, we're in a state of confusion. People are totally, totally lost. What, and they need that hello. They need that pat on the back. They need that embrace to say, don't worry, it's going to be okay. I'm here. Good morning. You don't know what that means. You don't know what that does for your, 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 your colleague, your person at work, your family member, your student, whoever it is, your son, your daughter at home. Just a simple good morning and good night at the beginning and end of the day can mamash change a person's day, his outlook, and the way he's going to continue through this awful time that we are experiencing right now. But maybe we can go a little bit further. Because what's special about this Mishnah, says Rabbi Matya, uh, says um, uh, Rav Tversky, of course, in his book, Revisions of the Fathers, who we've been quoting the last few weeks, is if you pay attention to the syntax of the Mishnah, Initiate a greeting to every person. The word for greeting is shalom. But shalom as well can also mean peace. And says Rav Tversky, quoting Rav Yaakov Yosef Apulna, that the meaning of this Mishnah is not to initiate a greeting, but to initiate peace with everyone. 
And even if you've been involved in a dispute with somebody, don't wait for the other party to, in, to initiate, to begin re- reconciliation. Be the first person to be Oef Shalom Berodef Shalom. Initiate peace by swallowing your pride, particularly it may be as, uh, 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 even that means that if you concede that maybe you were in the wrong, don't let that re- restrain you from starting the process. We have so many great stories of the Chachamim of our past, the personalities who sought peace at virtually any price. They gave no consideration to what that meant to their ego or their reputation. One in particular was of the Tosfot Yom Tov. Tosfot Yom Tov was one of the commentators on the Mishnah. And the wife of the Tosfot Yom Tov, whose name was Rav Yom Tov Lipman, his, the wife of him, of him was publicly humiliated in public again in public by another woman and when the leaders of the community found out about this they were outraged and they wanted to penalize put in cherem this woman how dare you speak to the wife of the the the, the tzaddik of the generation how dare you speak to her like that but they knew they couldn't do anything without the rabbi's approval so knowing that the rabbi was not going to pay attention to any of them, they asked the, wife, the rabbi's wife, the victim, to go and tell her husband how she was offended. And maybe by doing so, the rabbi will react. So the wife waited for, I guess, a propitious time. And several days later, when she felt that the husband might be receptive, she told him about the incident. And the rabbi responded, and you've been harboring a judge a, a, a grudge against her for the last several days? How can you do that? Don't you know that every night before you sleep, when you say Shema, you basically forgive anyone that has offended us? Do you not say that in your in your prayer before Kiryat Shema Lamita? How could you have retained this hatred and resentment for so long? You have to go to the woman and ask her forgiveness for having held a resentment against her. Unbelievable. So the rabbi's wife says, well, my husband's right. She went to the antagonizer, the woman who antagonized her, and she went to apologize to the woman for harboring a resentment. And that's when the woman who antagonized broke down into tears. She said, please forgive me. I was wrong. I need to be, I'm the one who has to ask you for forgiveness. I was rude towards you. We could have easily justified the rabbi's wife for waiting for the other woman to recognize her behavior and apologize. But but taking the initiative for peace, it was quickly restored. There was another story in the city of Slonim, where a man brazenly violated Shabbat publicly. And the local rabbi repeatedly warned the man to stop, stop breaking Shabbat publicly. And when the latter continued his defiance of the rabbi, the rabbi had no choice but to put him in cherem, he excommunicated him. The man was so angry, he came to the rabbi's house and threatened him. He pulled out a revolver, he pulled out a gun. And the members of the house quickly saw, they subdued him. They called the police and they arrested the person. And when the man came to trial, Rav Mordechai came to court, they called him to testify. But instead of testifying against the man, he pleaded for clemency. Let the guy go. And the man was released. Because for our Torah personalities, for our great tzaddikim, who are humble and great, it was not a sacrifice to set aside their ego. They would appease anyone that offended him. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't say the famous story of Rabbi Meir Balanes, who just today was his Hilula on the 14th of Iyar. The story, the Talmud relates that Rabbi Meir was enthralling his audience with his beautiful expositions and commentaries on the Torah on Erev Shabbat one Friday afternoon. And one time there was a lady who went to the Bemidrash to hear the shiur of Rabbi Meir, but this shiur went on a little bit too long. And this caused her to be late for dinner. And by the time she came back to the house, the lights, the Shabbat candles were already extinguished. Of course, there was no electricity the Shabbat candles is what provided light in order to enjoy the meal. And the husband was absolutely furious. Where were you? 
Where was I? I? I wasn't partying. I wasn't at Starbucks. I was listening to a shiur of Rabbi Meir Balanes. The husband was so enraged, he kicked her out of the house in the most degrading way, yelling at her verbal abuse to no end, and tells her, you don't come back into this house unless you spit in the face of Rabbi Meir Balanes. This is what he said. Don't dare come back in this house. It, the story goes on to say that Eliyahu and Avi came to Rabbi Meir to let him know about what happened. First of all, telling him that you delayed because of your delay in the shiur. This is what you caused. You caused a shalom bayit issue. And be prepared because she's on her way. Rabbi Meir purposely went to the big Bet Midrash, not the small Bet Midrash, because he wanted everybody to see what was about to happen. And the lady comes and she starts praying and praying and praying. Praying to who? Praying to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. She needs to go back. She needs to see her family. She needs a place to... She needs a roof over her head. How can she say it's being the streets? Her husband hates her. Please, Hashem, help me. Rabbi Meir sees the woman and realizes he needs to take action. And he gets up on a chair and he announces publicly in front of the whole Kahal, in front of the whole Bet Midrash, hundreds of students there. And he says, Rabotai, I've been affected by an Ainara the spell of an evil eye. And the only cure, the only way this could be removed is for someone to spit in my eye seven times. And he looked at the woman who was praying. He says, can you do it? Can you pray? Can you spit in my eye seven times? And finally, the woman couldn't believe it. So she spit. And the Rabbi Meir wiped the spit off, her, off his eye and said, spit again. And she wiped it again. Seven times she spit in the face. And after the seventh time, Rabbi Meir looked at her and says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go back to your husband and I want you to tell him that you did even more than he demanded. He asked you to spit at me once and you did it seven times. She left and she couldn't believe it. At that moment, all the students of Rabbi Meir Balanes asked, Rabbi, how can you let this happen? How can you degrade yourself? How can you allow a person man or woman, to come in here and spit in your face. You are the greatest of the generation. Is this not diminishing respect of Torah by total self-effacement? And what did he answer famously, quoting his rabbi, Rabbi Akiva? And he says that, of course, regarding the mitzvah of sota, where a woman who is accused by her husband to be unfaithful, the Kohen writes on a parchment the name of God, and that name of God is erased. Even though the name is erased, even though it constitutes a sinful desecration of holiness, Rabbi Meir says that God prefers that His name be erased in order to restore harmony between man and wife. And if Hashem is willing to have His name erased for the sake of peace between husband and wife, if God is willing to efface Himself for the sake of Shalom, Am I going to be different? I'm not going to be different. Let her spit in my face seven times. I am no different than I can do. I'm no different than, than what God wants. If God is willing to have his name erased and spit in my face as much as it takes so I can increase peace. That's what we begin every single day in our introductory prayers of Korbanot. We recite a portion of the Talmud that lists the mitzvot which one is rewarded during his lifetime as well as Olam Abba. And one of these items that we are rewarded is Haba'at Shalom ben Adam l'chavero uben ish leishto. Restoring the peace between man and wife and between man and his fellow man. And this is maybe what Rabbi Matya ben Kharash is saying, that not only to initiate a greeting, to initiate a hello, the common courtesy that is involved and every single day when we wake up, the good morning, the hellos, hi, how are you? That can change a person's life, can change a person's day. You don't know what that greeting will be, but all the more so. That same word shalom, which means hello, can also mean peace. To initiate peace between man and his fellow, husband and wife, and how important it is. The only, the kli bracha that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has is that of shalom. This is how we are supposed to go through our day they increase peace, they seek for peace, they seek peace. Ohev shalom, berodev shalom. The Mishnah ends with the words, Veheve zanav la arayot, Veal tehi rosh le shualim. 
be a tail to lions rather than a head to foxes. In Torah literature, the lion symbolizes might, koach, but not, not just a physical strength, but rather the strength of being a master to oneself. As we're going to learn in next, in next parak, in parak Hamishi, Gibor Ka'ari, be as strong as a lion so that you will do the will of your heavenly father. The fox, on the other hand, is sly. The fox is cunning. It's, it's no secret. Maybe that's why in the children's episode, uh, children's uh, show, Dora the Explorer, right? The fox, swiper, no swiping, because the fox is cunning, it's sly, it's out there to cheat. The teaching of this Mishnah is thus that a person should associate with people who are masters of themselves, who are able to subdue their physical desires rather than those who use their cunning to circumvent Torah. The latter half of the Mishnah can maybe be or should be an extension of Rabbi Matiyah's sta- first statement. The reference to be a tail of a lion rather than a head, rather than a leader, is an instruction to those who seem to want to bolster their sagging self-esteem by assuming a position of domination over their inferiors. The saying goes, what makes a little child happy? Seeing another child who is smaller than himself. As with so many other sayings, it's important insight here. The child who feels small, who feels dwarfed by the adults, the giant adults in his environment, is so happy and delighted when he feels that now he's taller than someone else. People who think poorly of themselves may want to seek to associate themselves with others who they are now the superior of. But what does a person do if he can't find anyone to do so where he can't, where he can't find someone else who's inferior to him? God, for, God forbid he begins to degrade and belittle others. He thinks of himself as better than them. And he can, he can debase other people. In, in addition to la shonara, slander, there, there's, there's belittling, there's insulting, so much horrible things that a person can do to show that he is on top and the other person is inferior. In the first portion of the Mishnah, Rabbi Matya is advocating self-effacement for the sake of peace. Lower yourself. Rabbi Meir was the greatest of the generation, but you could spit in my face for the purpose of, of peace. People with low self-esteem cannot afford, however, to efface themselves because this is too threatening for their ego. And therefore, it requires a, a healthy self-concept. He suggests associating with the wiser Chachamim, even if they're the tail, but they're the tail of the lions because they have control over themselves. A healthy self-esteem enables a person to implement both of Rabbi Matya's, of Rabbi Matya's teachings. Be the tail of the lions rather than the head of the foxes. It's better to be in the company of those people who are greater than us in Torah. Better to be the lowly, humble student of lions rather than the scholar among the foxes. We often adapt to our environment. If we associate ourselves with the Chachamim, we will both learn from their ways and be motivated through growth, having a growth mindset. On the other hand, if we associate ourselves with those who are unlearned, the Ameha Aretz, we will stagnate we won't move. We will have little incentive to progress forward. We will have little incentive to realize our full potential. There are few who are so self-motivated as to require no outside stimulus for spiritual growth. Everybody needs a push. You're listening now because you need a push. And I prepare these shiurim because I need a push. And I have my library in front of me which you can't see because I need pushes. Everybody needs that stimulus for growth. No one is exempt. Only through having our role models, our rabbis, our spiritual leaders, and recognizing who we ourselves can be, that's going to allow us to be inspired to follow the path of the lions in front of us. And just like we learned in a previous Mishnah in Perkei Avod, Bimkom She'en Anashim Ishtadel Yot Ish, in a place where there is no men, or there are no men to strive to be a man, when one realizes that he or she has acquired the knowledge, has acquired the experience, is qualified 
over to give others. You have to do so. This is your job. This is your opportunity. Experience is the best teacher, as we said in the previous class. You are the parent. Your children looks up, look up to you because you have the experience. They don't know better. For better or for worse, there comes a time in our lives where people are going to look up to us, where people are going to want to learn from our ways. Our children or younger, less experienced acquaintances or colleagues, associates, we have to be prepared to assume that role as a leader and role model to others. At the same time, however, we have to see ourselves not solely as a head, but also as a tail. We need to continue to look upwards towards our own teachers, towards our own spiritual mentors for guidance, for inspirations. We may at times deservedly see ourselves as leaders, and that's fine. Role models to others, and that's fine. But at the same time, we have to be we have to continue to be the same humble and unassuming student we once were and continually strive to be. That's why we're called, we're, the Torah scholars are called Talmid Chacham. Because even though they may be wise, but they're still referred to as a Talmid. They're still a student. They know where they came from. They know their beginnings. They know it's a constant learning process. You are Talmid Chacham. You're teaching hundreds. You're teaching thousands of people. I'm in the Bet Midrash. Everybody looks up to me. But know where you came from. Know where you came from. Be willing to lower yourselves for the sake of peace, for the sake of greeting other people. Don't consider yourself uh, superior than others. No, that person has to greet me. That person has to say hello. I don't understand why this person hasn't emailed me in three months. Have you emailed him? Did you stop saying, why didn't you email him? No, he deserves to email me. So now it's becoming a, a, a fight, an argument based on, on, on arrogance, lack of humility, because no one wants to click the send button. Hi, long time no speak. Send. That's all it takes is a few simple words. And you never know. You never know what that hello can be. You never know where initiating that conversation, initiating that peace can lead to. You may have never thought in a million years that you had something in common with that individual. But a simple hello, how are you? What you doing? Oh, oh yeah, you took your kids to play soccer. You like soccer? Oh my God, I also like soccer. What do you like? Oh, you follow the Premier League? I also follow the Premier League. Boom. You're now friends. You have something in common. You can speak about it on your spare time. You build an acquaintance. You invite them for Shabbat. That friendship grows and matures and matures. He sees what you have. He sees your family. Maybe that person becomes more spiritual, more religious. All from what? From a simple hello. How are you? Oh, you like soccer. So do I. Something so simple. But something so valuable. Something that we cannot push aside. Something so pashut. The holy man who had light shining from his face. A man who you would never think would say something so simple, so clear, is making this message clear to all of us. Let us do this effort. Let's make the effort to be maktim shalom kol alam, whether it's as simple as a hello, how are you, good morning, a WhatsApp message, a text message, an email, just wishing everybody a wonderful day, wishing everybody a Shabbat shalom, so on and so forth. Or if you take it to the next level, to initiate peace, like a bimeir balanes, like all our great chachamim that did whatever they could, push aside their ego, to push aside their reputation, doesn't matter. For the sake of Shalom, if HaKadosh Baruch Hu is willing to have His name erased, then I'll do whatever it takes. And through that, we'll be zochet to wonderful, wonderful things. Wishing everybody a wonderful night ahead. Good night.